Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you that in the midst of, uh, of our pursuit of, of happiness that you that you show us the way, show us how to be happy and, and uh, how to be blessed, in fact, that you do bless us. So we pray for eyes to see, we pray for ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So a question for you to begin, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Some of the things that come to mind are whether or not we'll have enough money, um, how can we make ourselves safe and secure, whether or not we'll get sick. I suppose a lot of us might be afraid of eventual death. And with Sandy, uh, maybe we're afraid that we won't be happy. And so we work really hard to chase our tail and, and try to find that happiness somewhere and somehow. I'm uh, struck by how there's whole industries that are devoted to trying to capitalize on our fears so that we will buy their product. And certainly as we come up on another election, um, they too are trying to maximize our fear and pointing that out so that we will listen to their pitch and buy what they are selling as well. There used to be a, a bumper sticker, no fear, is that still around? And I think what that implies is, did John have one on his car? Is that what Kim's smiling? (laughs) Um, Maybe he still has it on his on his Audi. I don't know. Um, But what I I don't know what that means. But does that imply that we stir up bravery in ourselves so that we are not afraid? Again, I'm not sure what what that means. No fear, and, and how we're supposed to accomplish that. What I think I do find in the Bible is the message that in the face of what causes fear in our lives, whatever those many things are, that God is faithful in the face of our fear. And so there's a relationship between our fear and faith, between our, our uh, likelihood that we will despair and our maintaining hope. There's uh, a billboard on the 112th across from the mall as you're driving east, I guess. It says, it's one of those, there's several of them around, but fear is contagious, so is hope. And then it goes on to say, I think hope is within. I would, I would say that it's within as long as we have God with us, ultimately. So thinking about our, our reading today with Joseph, talk about a, a series of unfortunate events, wherever that wherever that came from. but um, And there's a larger story for Joseph um, around what we heard today. So first of all, Joseph is sold by his brothers, believe it or not. Elizabeth, have you ever wanted to sell Peter? <laughs> yes, but fortunately you haven't done that, right? Or Adam, maybe? Wouldn't it be nice sometimes to show Brandon the door? So if there's some... <laughs> There's a herd of, uh, if there's some camels and all these Bedouins riding them comes by your house, I don't know. Maybe it's crossed your mind. He sold to into Egypt, so it just keeps getting worse. And the, the captain of Pharaoh's guard purchases him and makes him a slave in his house. And then, as we heard at the end of the story, he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he is thrown into the dungeon, dungeon, thrown into prison. So Joseph, in the midst of all of that, was no doubt afraid, wouldn't you say? And he likely despaired. In our prayer of the day, we talked about how he spent long years in prison. So it wasn't like he got in Friday night and by Monday morning he was back home. In the midst of all of that, these unfortunate events. The reading says that the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. His master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. 
So see how it's talking in, in just over and over again about how God was with him and that he was blessed. So Joseph found favor in his master's sight, and, and so he made him the overseer of his house. The Lord blessed Potiphar's house. As a result, blessing, the blessing of the Lord was on all that Potiphar had for Joseph's sake. So to sum that up, maybe the things that things are going well for Joseph, right? He's blessed. God is with him. But the reality is that he's still a slave. He's not free. He would much rather have been back home in his father's house. So I think, don't we experience that too? The twists and turns of life, they, they sometimes take us to places that we would rather not be. Sometimes we can be disappointed. Sometimes we can be unhappy with our lot. And so how does faith and how does hope How does that enter into those circumstances? And how does that sustain us? So Joseph, at the end of the reading, is unjustly accused and gets thrown into prison. I kind of see that as just really the the first story sold by his brothers and sold into slavery in Egypt. This is really the same story, just told again in a different way. Again, God is with him. Again, he is blessed. So two scenes, the same story, but he's still not free. Can you hear Joseph crying out to God, Thanks a lot, God. Here I was being all righteous and everything, following you, and and this is my reward. I get out of the frying pan and into the fire. I'm no longer a slave, now I'm in prison. So just to confirm that he wasn't exactly happy with his locks, the the story goes on and... and, um, the Pharaoh's uh, cupbearer, the one that brought him his gold cup so he could drink his wine, he's about to be released from prison, and Joseph says, Remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. For in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing wrong that I should be put into this dungeon. You can imagine the dungeon was a fearful place. You can imagine as time went on and he was still there, still in prison, that he was moved to despair. Now, that's the same story one and two times in our reading, and I think possibly the same story comes up again for a third time. Joseph does eventually get out of prison, and Pharaoh blesses him, says, you shall be over my house and all of my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. So Joseph is now number two over Egypt. So he's had, instead of a series of unfortunate events, now his, the events surrounding him are extremely fortunate. Pharaoh takes off his, his ring of power, gives it to Joseph. He uh, gives him a chariot to ride, puts on a a cloak over him and, and commands everyone bow the knee when Joseph goes by. So th- now things are going really well for Joseph, and God is still with him. But at the same time, he's really, even though he's number two in the, the whole country of Egypt, he's still a slave. He's still not free. He's still not at home with his father. So I wonder, in the end, really, with these three stories that are really the same story, Is Joseph really a metaphor for the people of Egypt and their eventual exodus from slavery in Egypt? They were in slavery for over 400 years. And as generation followed generation, and and they were still slaves, did they have a tendency to despair that they would ever get out of their situation? And how about our own history with slavery? Us too, generation after generation, and people are born into slavery, they die in slavery. Would it ever change? Where in the midst of this reality do we find faith and hope? So our reading today was was one piece of Joseph's story, and Joseph's story is much bigger than what we heard today. And I would say that Joseph's story, the whole story, is, is part of a larger story that encompasses the whole Old Testament and the whole Bible. In our reading today in Genesis 39, 
God continues his covenant with his people. And especially the promise that he made to Noah and then to Abraham. God doesn't specifically speak in our reading today, but the narrator describes the promise. I am with you. I am with you in the midst of all that he has to endure. Maybe a way to illustrate that in chapter 37 of Genesis is where Joseph is sold by his brothers. Chapter 38 is a little interlude, and we spend a little time with one of his other brothers, with Judah, and how he has, has twins, actually, through his daughter-in-law, Tamar. If you don't know that story, it's, it's a wonderful story. Um, I wonder why that story is there in the midst of the story of Joseph. It's possible that one, it's because one of those twins is named Perez, and Perez is in the line of King David. And so possibly it's in the Old Testament because it's pointing to the work that God is doing through his people that began with Abraham and continues through Joseph and Perez and on to King David. And for Christians, we know that Jesus is in the line of King David as well. So we know that God is working in the midst of this whole story. You often hear when something bad happens, well, God's got a plan. Have you ever heard that? And we don't usually like that, do we? We don't like hearing that, that God's got a plan and it includes what's happening to me right now. Well, you can imagine Joseph wasn't real thrilled if somebody told him that God had a plan for him being in prison. And remember, he says to the cupbearer to do whatever he can to get him out of prison. But what if God's plan is working salvation in the midst of all this, through Joseph and and through us? God's plan was salvation that began with his promise to Abraham and his descendants, and is continuing in this story of Joseph. This is a story about God's salvation, not only for us, that we be rescued from our prison, but also working salvation through us. The gospel means that our story, and Joseph's story, all of us, our stories, are part of this sweeping story of God's salvation. That God is busy making all things new, through the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so in the midst of all the twists and turns of our lives and the joys and disappointments, God is at work. God is at work making salvation happen. When Jesus stands up in the temple or the synagogue in in Nazareth, his hometown, and he gets the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the oppressed. to to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to comfort all who mourn. Did you hear that in the Beatitudes as well from Matthew? That those who are like Joseph, those who are poor in spirit, those who are mourning, those who are meek, those who who hunger and thirst for righteousness or maybe just a little justice in their lives, those who are merciful and pure, those who are uh, peacemakers, or if you remember last week, those who are peace builders. To be a peace builder, if you you read this little book that that some of you read over the summer by, by McGill about suffering, and his point was that we take a different path when we follow God, a different path and a different form of power So when the power of the world is like Pharaoh throwing people in prison, people sold into slavery, when that is is power, we don't respond to that in kind. Instead, we respond with a different kind of power. Miguel says that the power that God uses to overcome injustice and and evil in the world and our form of power, that God's power is love and self-giving. So when the Bible talks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, it's referring to how God exercises 
his power in the world today. How God's power is present among us in self-giving love. And so then we are invited to join God and and God's reign in the world, to be a part of that, to share love and self-giving with others. We are a people with our own stories caught up in this one story of God's salvation. So to close, we have many things that we are afraid of that cause us to fear. It's not that we shouldn't be afraid. That's not the message. Instead, how do we face our fears? How do we overcome them? Faith stands in the breach against our fear, and hope chases away our despair. And the biblical message is that God is faithful. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you that you are faithful, that you are always with us, that you have promised never to leave us. So when we are afraid, when we are tempted to despair, help us to look to you as our light and as our salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen.